can, can you guys hear me okay in the back? Hopefully not getting any feedback. Yeah, good to see. Getting some thumbs up, although I see there's some chatters in the back. Good, good, good. I understand you're having a wonderful conversation. We're about to have the application security smackdown, as I like to call it. <laughs> so. Smackdown? Well, it'll be too much of a smackdown. I'll leave my laptop. No, you can't leave your laptop up here, sir. <laughs> cool. All right, everybody. So welcome. Uh, first of all, before we get started, I would like to say that this has been a pretty incredible conference. Uh, I have not seen a conference of this size run by a team uh, of such a tight-knit group of people that is uh, that few, quite frankly. So uh, for the organizers, especially Julian and, and Pamela, big round of applause. This has been pretty awesome. So. Anyway, welcome everyone. This is Application Security Smackdown. I am your host, Keith Hoodlitz. I have been prepared with some questions and accepted no bribes thus far. Um, so if you know you want to pass, by all means, uh, you can pass the buck. Uh, so uh, with that, I do have a few questions already kind of prepared. We are going to take some questions from the audience as well because, of course, this is for you. Um, so with that, my panel today is Julian, of course, Julian Burton, as everybody knows, the main organizer of AppSec Day. So thank you, Julian, for joining. Liam, by the way, uh, really badass poster over here with assurance.com.au, uh, so definitely check them out. Uh, then we, of course, have Ken Johnson from GitHub uh, here with us today. And finally, Lydia, I'm not going to pronounce your last name because I'll probably butcher it, but Lydia. <laughs> so a um, lot of diverse thought uh, you know, in, in mind share here. Uh, Lydia's got some expertise in endpoint protection. Uh, Ken, of course, is, uh, well, GitHub, I mean, let's face it, you've got a lot of different problems that you're dealing with. Uh, a lot of different problems that you're dealing with, I mean, uh, no, I, I totally feel that as well, especially big companies. Um, and then, uh, you know, Assurance, actually finding the problems, right? Throwing rocks at glass houses, because we live in them. Uh, and Julian, very similarly as well. So, uh, with that, the first question that I have, I'm actually going to pull this off and put this here, because it's probably a little bit better. No, no, we'll do this. Uh, so... Uh, this is for the whole panel. Feel free to dive in uh, accordingly. But for the companies that use modern development patterns, uh, so the microservice architectures, REST APIs, Docker containers, and all of that good stuff, uh, do automated solutions that is, such as uh, static or dynamic analysis help over, in this case, or in versus, uh, initiatives and controls compared to the efforts and costs that go into implementing those controls? Thoughts from the panel? I feel like you're all looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> Full disclosure, I wrote that question. <laughs> I was kind of um, directed at Ken a little bit because I did his training last week on secure code review. So, um, yeah, I'll take. Yeah, sure, absolutely. I'll dig right into starting point. And then yeah, yeah. Well, so and to be clear, like we don't use like a paid static analysis tool. So ours has got a lot of custom checks. Um, we do have static analysis so that, like, for example, if you're working on, if you're pushing code to, say, like, um, a non-master branch, uh, and you're a developer, and something happens, like, it comments and tells you, hey, uh, or, like, if you've done something you shouldn't, then uh, it'll comment to you, but doesn't tell us, right? Because it's not in master, it's not going to prod. And then if it gets pushed to prod and there's something that is interesting that we should look at, we get an issue assigned to us accordingly. Um, the cost to develop that, uh, you know, as opposed to what it's found, it's, it's, I guess it's a fair point. Um, I like having the assurance that it's there. Uh, we certainly find far more value in the manual approach than we do the static approach. But like one thing I, I think we've talked about publicly is that we have some patterns that we uh, follow. So we have a CSP. And so then if like um, you're a developer and you choose to modify that CSP for like external third-party JavaScript or doing something like that, then uh, we... Uh, content security policy that is not following oh. That's a new web browser standard, kind of newish. It's kind of old, but it's not really used. And GitHub, uh, one of the first people, uh, along with the other tech companies that are starting to actually do it well, it's really hard and complicated to kind of get something going. So it's kind of a work in progress in the industry. You should totally do it if you're not. Like, that should... Absolutely, be one of the things you do in your secure, your application security program. 
Uh, for us, if someone modifies, like we have checks, if someone modifies, uh, they specifically have to like change something that allows them to include like another site for, I don't know, iframing or JavaScript or whatever, we get notifications. So like there are certain things such as that that are very valuable for us. But again, the cost is not necessarily super high uh, for us, but we don't use like a paid for solution. So now I've used a paid for solution and I'll, I mean, I don't know if you want me to talk to it, but it's absolute garbage. Like it's like my experience <laughs> has been absolute garbage. Like, sorry, if you work for a vendor that does that, that's just been my experience. So, so, so I'm actually going to go to Liam for a second, because Liam, you've got a background in, in development and of course now in actually doing pen testing. Um, what has been your experience in terms of like the bugs that you found in code versus like, hey, a dynamic scanner or a static analysis scanner would have found that? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I, I think um, to, to, to talk a little bit more about the earlier question, go, go back to what you just said. Um, I think these, you know, expensive static analysis tools are expensive. So you know, the question is, you know, how much value am I going to get out of this? Like, it, it sort of depends a lot on your maturity. Like, um, obviously, you know, GitHub are... Uh, I hope, you know, <laughs> very high on, you know, like the, the security maturity level. I hope so too. <laughs> yeah. Um, but if you're not, like, it may not make sense to, you know, like, immediately copy the patterns of, you know, like, the companies that are at the top of the game if, if you're not. Because, you know, you can put in a lot of money and a lot of effort to try and sort of jump two rungs of the ladder at the time. Uh, where m maybe that's not the best place to invest your money. So, you know, there, there are some good, free static analysis tools out there um, that, you know, maybe they won't pick up uh, the exact same number as the expensive ones. But, you know, have you used the free ones? Have you shaken out all the bugs in your code base using the free ones? Um, then you go, okay, um, that was useful. Let's, let's try and take it to the next level. Um, so you, you don't always want to sort of just jump straight into here's a problem, let's throw our entire, you know, security budget for the year at it. So as a follow-up, Lydia, you do a lot of work in the endpoint space as well, and I'm sure that there are a lot of companies that um, rather than buying static analysis or dynamic analysis tools, they say, we can just protect this with endpoint protection and we'll be fine, right? Right. <laughs> um... Look, Endpoint is a really interesting space. Um, there's, I've done a lot of testing, probably on about nine products at the moment, and just really echoing what Liam is saying is that just because you buy a product, don't expect that it's going to solve everything. Um, a lot of the products that I've tested, um, I was able to railroad every single one of them, just doing simple, simple techniques, um, and it's. It, it's, it's a diverse space and um, you really need to understand what your requirements are, what your, what, your, what your output is and what problem you're trying to solve to be able to figure out which tool, whether it's endpoint, static analysis, vulnerability scanning, whatever it is, if those requirements are going to satisfy um, your, your business case. And it, it, it always comes back to what problem you're trying to solve. Awesome. So actually... Uh Pamela, if I could actually have you walk this around for any questions as well. We do you have another? Oh, you have one over there. Perfect. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. I'm going to do one more question, and then we can walk around and get other people's questions as well. Phones. So, oh. Yeah. Because yeah. they're sharing, so. There we go. Now we get more people. Um, so I like this question a lot. And again, this is one that Julian put together. But what can a tech person do tomorrow to start improving the security of their software? Or their enterprise, in this case, if it's maybe, you know, put an AV on that box, because you don't have one there now. Anybody? So the question is, like, what can you do tomorrow to improve, like, your security posture just in general of, like, you're, you're talking about specifically software security or... Maybe it's like, a web server, maybe it's your, you know, for Lydia, if, it, if it's broader for your business um, as well. But, of course, maybe it really is your software for the developers that are here or... Um, for the security professionals that are focusing on AppSec as well. So feel free to, you know, your opinions on what a company can do to get more secure now. Maybe it's single sign-on, for example, right? Are we talking about what somebody can do tomorrow? Yeah. I mean, maybe they don't have the budget to spend for it, but maybe there's free tools that they can go search to look at, et cetera. 
Well, I was even thinking something a little bit different as well, is um, as a matter of you're doing lots of stuff at work and sometimes you can't do the R&D that you want to do. So, um, not that I'm telling people not to do work-life balance, but I'm, I'm a real, real big fan of building your own lab at home. You know, so if you want to, if you want to be, uh, you know, a, a web server guru, go home and play with stuff. I think I've got about ten different virtual boxes at home, different different VMs, different different Linux distributions. Um, so if I really want to understand how something works, I, but I'm a very visual person, I have to go away and and, and play with it myself. Um, and just that passion and drive to help you understand, I really think helps you get better at your job as well. Cool. Other other opinions? Yeah, I mean, like, I made a lot of mistakes the first time I built an AppSec program, and, like, the first thing I would have done going back in retrospect would be to inventory, all, like, find a reliable way to inventory all of my assets, as well as, like, understand, when I say inventory, like, what versions of the frameworks they're running, what type of frameworks, what languages. Uh, there was a solution we ended up working with the ops folks on where we could, uh, they kind of, like, had all of this tracking information, and just by communicating with them, we had access to it on AppSec eventually. Again, I made a lot of mistakes. And uh, yeah, so like that was a great way to just, and the reason I say it is like, first of all, we all know your software should be up to date, right? And uh, secondly, um, if a new advisory comes out, you obviously need to be able to update. And then also you need to know who the owners are of those applications in that instance, or if you like do find a bug or you have got a bug bounty and it gets reported and something like that. Like these are really pivotal things to know, like where your applications are, what information they're holding, their software versions, et cetera. Um, I, look, it, it depends, I guess, on whether this question is pitched at, you know, organizations or, or individuals. Um, I'd say for organizations, um, the, the one place where you will always, always get bang for buck is just investing in people. You know, like people, like some organizations will pay competitive salaries and then have ridiculously small training budgets and, you know, time allocations. It's like, these are your people. These are the people who are building all your tools. Like, enable them, you know, like, let them work for you. Um, organizations, you know, you will always get your money back investing in people. Um, and I guess for, if the question is, you know, what can an individual do to, you know, help secure things in the future, it, it's sort of the same answer, you know, um, talk to people, you know, come, come to conferences, come to meetups, um, you know, like, I, I don't like the, you know, phrase networking, you know, it's like, because it, it's so, like, impersonal, it's like, it's making friends, you know, like, talk to people in the industry that, you know, you get along well with and, you know, hang out in Slack channels with them and, you know, like, most of the time in Slack channels, I'm talking with, you know, incredibly smart people about incredibly dumb things like what movies we saw. And then all of a sudden I'll say, oh, hey, wait, I've got a technical problem that's so esoteric. But this person is, you know, like literally one of the best people in the world at this particular thing. And rather than me wasting a day trying to research it, I can just say, hey, um, can you give me the five minute rundown on this? And being able to um, just sort of have friends who are great at tech, but in maybe not the same areas as you is just, I mean, it's been invaluable in my career. Cool. Sorry. Uh, all right. Uh, so uh, based on the kind of the feedback here, I want to ask a controversial question in, in the security space, which is certifications, boot camps, or degrees. You can pick two. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would say none of or the not. above. <laughs> like, none of the above, really, honestly. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Like, it's, my career path is so different from everyone else. So, like, for me, it would be silly for me to sit here and be like, oh, you need a degree, you need a certification, you need boot camp, because I did none of those things. Well, maybe we can do it from a student perspective and then from a technology professional perspective trying to get into security. So there are two different pathways. Uh -huh. um, I feel like as a student, it's probably a little bit harder to kind of get your foothold without that years of experience as a, say, developer or someone else. Um, so potentially getting that kind of junior level role, a cert of some sort, like a decent one like OSCP, for example, may help getting that foot in the door. But for someone like who's been a dev for like 10 years or whatever, they might not need to go down that road. As, for, from my perspective, I mean, it really depends on the organization you're trying to get a job at. Um, most security teams will... Um, understand passion when they see it. So, like, 
whether it's you get your OCP, that's understanding that you've got commitment and you're really keen to try and get into security. Um, so I think from that perspective, it, whether it's a degree or a cert or anything else, showing that passion, whether you go into events like this, for example, and learning heaps and hanging out in community forums and like really getting to know the community and asking questions and getting involved in CTFs and all that kind of stuff. Um, that seems like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, to get an entry-level position, I agree, like, to, to at least get your foot in the door. But from that point forward, it's like, you know, does it make sense for me necessarily to go after a CISSP every year? No. So you're right. There's two different. There's, like, professional and, and student. And so, yeah. I can agree on the, at least the entry-level piece. Like, that's good. Yeah, yeah. I just want to echo what Julian said as well. Um, I, I'm pretty standard. I've got the degrees. I've got the, the certifications. When I get asked this question, it's very much, well, what, what's your goal? What's your end goal? And as a student, I think you need to have some sort of degree as a baseline, but I'm not necessarily advocating that because you have to do what feels good for you. But in an interview stage, your passion and your commitment and what you want to do typically shines um, above everything else anyway. Um, but things like this definitely add value and you've really got to decide what your path is and how that adds value back to who you are as an individual. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with all that. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit old school in that, um, like, I, if, if for people starting their career, you know, I'm still a big believer in the in the university system. I think it can um, lay a really solid foundation for careers. Um, in terms of certification, um, I'm a little bit conflicted because, um, like, for, for my particular field, pen testing, um, the, the best regarded certification, um, I have a number of issues with it. So, um, like, OSCP is one that everyone talks about. Um, you know, you, you study for months and then you do this, like, 24-hour um, exam, um, which is absolute bullshit. Um, I, I would never expect an employee of mine to work for 24 hours. Um, I don't think people should have to do that as part of a, an exam. You know, this is, like, a terrible part of tech culture, this sort of, like oh, you know, spend everything, you know, sleeps for the week. It's like, no, that's that's crap. You know, like this is promoting uh, a really um, bad culture, but it's... Is that because you failed? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, mate. Nice <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I think, like, uh, certifications uh, have, have a long way to go and we can uh, we can definitely improve them a lot. So now that the first fist has been thrown. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for the panel that they also want to ask as well? I want to make sure we leave some time for that. So just raise your hand. We'll bring a mic over to you. Up here in the blue. Yeah, so a lot of the uh, talks today have been about uh, prevention so, and how, how to move that earlier in, in the uh, pipeline, I guess, of work. Um, not many have talked much about detection. And a lot have also talked about how the black hats have a big advantage over the white hats because you know, the white hats only have to do one thing wrong to get, uh, get done. So uh, what do you think about uh, spending money on uh, detection and response as well? That sounds like... <laughs> yeah, that's definitely a Lydia question to start. It is, it is a me question. I'm just actually pondering the question because I want to make sure I answer it properly. Um, I'm very much a SecOps person. I have been for a very long time. Um, so let me make sure I've got the question. What do I think about detection and response? Yeah, if I have $100,000 or something to spend, I'm better um, hiring more developers or uh, mm -hmm. and putting in a program or putting in detection on my application stack, um, you know, things like cloud workload detection or seeing what's going on in the market. Look, I, th I think as a base, you need to have some sort of prevention, at, at least uh, at a minimum. You can get a lot of you know, stuff that's quite good value for money. And then from a um, response and uh, detection and response perspective, um, I think there's lots of um, good open source stuff, at least that I'm investigating at the moment. I don't believe you need to spend thousands and hundreds of dollars on um, um, detection and response. There's lots of good stuff that you can use that's freely available you can do yourself. Um, I'm not going to flog MITRE too much, but I'm a real big fan of the, the MITRE attack matrix, if anyone's seen that. Um, it's focusing on um, behavioural detection as opposed to indicators of compromise. Um, whilst I think indicators of compromise are good initially because it leaves a footprint, it's always too late. 
Whereas if we're trying to focus on um, the behaviour, the entry point, not necessarily the adversaries or the fancy bears or the AP220 agents, the same thing, um, I don't really care about the attribution part of it because I'm hurting right now. So a lot of my focus at the moment is trying to understand the entry point and from a lot of the research that I'm doing currently, you don't need to spend a lot of money to do that. Um, I think it's important to have the log history there because without it, you've got nothing. But I don't believe that right now we need to spend a lot of money to do that. There's lots of other things that we can do um, in-house to, to, to get that, at least at least that detection. So when prevention fails, then you've got that other thing that's triggering, triggering it. So something that we see all the time um, is like, you know, for detection obviously, you know, is dependent on your sensors and, you know, s sometimes, you know, you need to have, you know, canaries or, you know, malware detection for that. But um, a, a lot of the detection can also be done with logs. You know, you, ideally you want the full spectrum of it. But th the thing is, like, your logs are already being collected. What, what we really commonly see is ops teams who set up, like, fantastic log collection, um, analysis, alerting for ops events. And, like, you're 98% of the way there if you, like, if you just put in some security alerting as well. Yep. Like, this is a massive win for your security. Um, but, you know, op ops people do this because it makes their job easier. And, like, fair enough, and so they should. But, you know, that, that, little, that tiny little bit of communication where you can just say, like, Hey, so you know, ninety-eight percent of the infrastructure for security alerting is already there. Like, let's just throw in some more alerts. Um, it's it's a, such an easy win um, that yeah, everyone should just do it. Yeah, I just want to clarify some things about that too. So, there's different levels of detection along the different stack, right? So you've got like um, different protections you can put in place at like layer seven, so the application layer to detect like actual attacks like cross-site scripting, SQL injection at that point. And then you have some of the other things, which is like actual OS level detection, which is like, okay, someone's got remote code execution on your box or whatever else they've got. Um, and then you have different types of detection and log, or logs and all that kind of stuff would do that. So there is all of that stuff that they said is very valid. And then if you wanted to also do detection a bit higher up the stack, you can look into other, some tooling to do that for you. And there's a few, like it's basically called a web application firewall. Um, and there's several different vendors around that can do that. And that's, that's at that kind of different layer. Um, it won't, yeah, that's all I'll say about that. I think you also want to be mindful too that the logs that you're collecting are clean logs too, because it's, it's all on the got logging turned on, but if you don't have it in the right mode, you're not going to collect the logs. And then later, if you are involved in some sort of incident, you cannot bring everything together because the logs aren't there. So it's a, it's a bit of a two twofold process where you're collecting logs, you've got to make sure that they're the right logs and then it's not too verbose and then if you're collecting too many logs that the server isn't under pressure as well and then, you know, so it's, um, yeah, it's a bit of a balance. <laughs> I was thinking of maybe a follow-up to that one to put some pressure on you guys. So, for example, um, so I'm collecting all these logs. How do I possibly have enough time to actually look at them? Or better, to maybe make that a point of question, how do I get the right signal-to-noise ratio? It's the single pane of glass, the single pane of window, right? You can't. You've got, to, you've got to focus on what's important to you right now and just prioritise. That's the only way that you can do it. For the amount of logs that I've looked at in my life, you just... You, could, you would absolutely just suffocate and just run out of the room. And that's why you see a lot of SecOps analysts, the turnover is high because they're looking at too much, they're under a lot of stress. So it's up to managers and SOC operation teams to focus, to, to help us focus on what's important. And, um, and that's, in my, in, in, my, um, in my experience, that's just the best way to do it. You can't, you can't do everything. Yeah, and, and d different teams obviously, you know, have different criteria for what they need for the logs, like um, in terms of, you know, alerting on detecting an event, um, y you know, they, they can say, oh, you know, we need the signal to noise to be exactly right, you know, we can't have too many false positives or else, you know, you get that, you know, fatigue in the, in the SOC. Um, but then from an incident response point of view, you know, if you need like the forensic logs, like the people doing the incident response, like they need a lot more logs available um, than, you know, what, what you might have on just sort of the, the detection part of it. So, it's, yeah, in conclusion, it's hard. <laughs> Any other thoughts from the panel for... No? Okay. Who else has a question? Anybody? Bueller. 
right over here. Talking about? <laughs> you. We got, we got a couple. Cool. Um, so now I'm going way off on a tangent. I have taken over this this panel. Um, so so the idea. I'll about, be doing the interview now. No. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. I'm going to sit down now. Um, so think about polyglot. <laughs> so so Liam, actually, tell the audience what a polyglot is about. Uh, polyglot attack. Um, well, I mean, in, in general terms, a polyglot is like a file that's sort of, you know, valid um, uh, in different contexts. So, you know, a simple thing like, you know, it may be, you know, a PDF that is also a valid JPEG. Um, so, um, like, you know, what? cool, it's interesting. You know, why is it interesting from a security perspective is that, um, you know, like the, the idea of uh, safety versus unsafe is like, you know, you, we have these checkers and we, you know, Things can only be safe in a given context, so we can go, okay, you know, is this image safe? And you know, our image software looks at it and goes, yeah, yeah, it's cool, it's a valid JPEG, that's fine. And then, um, if that file is then, you know, opened by a PDF viewer, and you know, bam, you've you know dropped your shell code in, uh, you know, Adobe, um, cool, the bad bad guys win. So um, the, it's it's a great way of bypassing technologies because it essentially like completely confuses um, the technologies designed to prevent that. I did want to just real quickly like go back to that original question. There's something I left out, which was so in our culture, like if you submit a pull request to change code, like we'll try it out, right? I mean, we'll get eyes on it and just make sure it's nice and pretty and works well. And but like. We'll give it a shot, right? So I did have the ability to actually make changes to Ops's, like, uh, I don't know if it was Chef or Puppet or something like that. Uh, so I did go down that route. I just had other priorities that came up and shifted off of doing that. But it would, like that totally would have worked. And also, like, because with we've got a lot of chat ops, like, we can't, I could very easily deploy my uh, changes to, like, a staging or dev environment. Or, sorry, a, just really just a staging environment. So, like, I don't know if you have that available. You can definitely go down that route. But, yeah, for some of us, we just don't. <laughs> Other things come up and become a priority. So. That happens a lot in security. Yeah. Uh, yeah. New RCE vulnerability must patch. Um, Dumpster fire. Yeah, it's it literally <laughs> dumpster fires that we're putting out on a regular basis. But the point I was making about polyglots, though, and bringing it back to the RASP and IAS space, is that the polyglot is meant to execute in different places in your environment. And so there's things like XSS polyglots or SQL injection polyglots. And so maybe your front end validation of input is saying, oh, yeah, no, that's, that's a fairly well formed name. We'll let that through. But now when it hits, uh, say, the database server, it does something a little bit different, and suddenly now it's it's actually causing corruption on the way that it's presented back on, say, your profile page, uh, and suddenly you've got stored XSS, but you shouldn't have been able to put that in based on your input filters. And so, um, especially in traditional WAF space, that's kind of a sensitive topic for most companies because if you break it, you break a lot of things. And sometimes, I mean, if you're a GitHub of the world or even like Thermo Fisher Scientific, we, uh, we have like published revenues in the billions, like $20 billion. You break our e-commerce site and you are definitely hurting our business, right? So we can't let developers touch the web application firewall. Um, so great question, though. What other questions? Right here in the uh, grayish. If I'm, yeah, cool. We're good. <laughs> um, you just brought up dumpster fires. Um, kind of speaks to the reactionary nature of security sometimes. Yeah. I'm curious, uh, folks on the panel, to talk to any sort of programs, processes, tools. What, the, what that, that uh, move the needle most from a reactionary to a more proactive approach? Great question. Awesome question. Um, let, let's go let's start with Julian because I want to put him on the spot here and then work our way down. <laughs> um, really good question, by the way. Because um, that was actually a question I kind of had in my head was around like, um, I think, I feel like companies can get really obsessed with doing testing and then forget about prevention a lot of times. And it's really hard to get that balance between doing something that's going to like destroy a whole class of vulnerability like implementing content security policy and then all of a sudden all your XSS is gone. Um, that kind of big change is obviously really difficult and time consuming to implement in a lot of businesses that are quite large um, but it has like dr drastic effects like for firefighting down the line so you don't have to worry about that kind of issue as much in the in the future. So I feel like preventative wise there's a lot of things you can do in that category that's like, okay, um, another good one is uh, I think we've, 
one of the guys in our team wrote a script to detect subdomain takeovers using Route 53 um, and detecting when we, like, we had a bug bounty program that was just, like, subdomain takeover, subdomain takeover, and obviously with that kind of vulnerability, it's varying levels of severity depending on what the subdomain is, what cookies are available, what, you know, there's lots of different ways you can exploit that. Um, and then we just wrote this script that, like, pinged in Slack to say, hey, Team X, you've you've got a vulnerability in your application. Can you please remove this route from Route 3 or whatever it happened to be? Um, we saw like a drop off completely from the bug bounty program. Um, so we kind of use that at least the bug bounty program as like a benchmark as like how easy it is for attackers to find stuff. Um, uh, so that kind of thing took I don't know like less than a week to write like this you know whatever it was you know we have to maintain it over time but like that was drastically preventative and then we didn't have to have any of those fires again. So you can do little things like that and I think that comes back to one of the other questions around what you can do tomorrow, um, which I didn't mention, is like you don't have to be a security expert to do it. I think that was the kind of point around that question as well, which I forgot to make. Um, you can write like a little script that takes you, if you've got like a hackathon at your, your company or you've got like a few days, smash out something like this, this kind of script get some advice from the community if you're like unsure about exactly what to do. Um, and you can start to kind of kill off big classes of bugs um, and kind of longer term get rid of that, that risk at the company. And I think, to be honest, that's probably the biggest thing a lot of companies can do rather than trying to get static analysis working. Like, I'm not saying that these aren't valuable controls, um, but the, the effort you put into some of these other testing controls in that kind of testing phase um, can be kind of diminishing returns. Whereas if you kind of stay more in the preventative side of things and standards and like developing a pattern for like service to service or uh, those kind of things that would just over time really, really uh, lower the impact of a lot of things. So I'm so gonna make this a little bit harder by the way. So uh, please feel free to continue. Uh, Julie, you probably wanna fill in on this one, but um, one process or tool or technique that you would put in place in the organization to like quickly address some of these problems. So one thing that if you had to move from a, a reactionary to a proactive security, what's the one thing you would do? And also feel free to, you know, of course, opine a little bit as well, but um, I mean, you're putting, out, putting you on the spot here. One thing I would do. I think Don't forget to speak into the microphone, by the way. <laughs> um, one tool to rule them all. I don't, I don't, that's a really hard question. <laughs> We're going into Mordor. I need well, to let me let me ring. skip and then I'll think about it. I think Liam's got something obviously. All right. So um, same answer to, to both the questions. Um, so for, for dev teams, you know, we've been doing development for a long time, and we've had the industry has you know like various metrics that we can use to sort of you know measure the productivity of dev teams, and you know some of these metrics can be problematic, you know, um, in terms of you know quality and that sort of thing. But but we have metrics for it, and security teams have this problem that it's it's really hard to measure the effectiveness of a security team. Like you know, what is a good metric to sort of measure how? how your security team's going, you know, is your security team, you know, improving in their effectiveness over time? Um, and one, uh, like a really simple um, metric that um, apparently uh, has, has been, you know, working pretty well is just like measuring the percentage of your team that is working on, you know, fighting fires versus um, working proactively uh, on, you know, new security features. Um, because the, the, the problem with fighting fires is that, you know, like the whole security team is fighting fires and they say we need more firefighters um, so more people join the team. And then the, the fire sort of seems to like spread in proportion to the number of firefighters, unlike <laughs> a real fire, which is like where the metaphor breaks down. Um, but, you know, if, if the, the manager of that team, you know, if, if their KPIs are based on, you know, like show that you're, you know, fighting fewer and fewer fires over time, they're going to work really, really hard and they're going to come up with some creative strategies, you know, with, without, you know, being prescriptive about how they should do it. Um, they'll go, OK, cool. And all of a sudden, um, like over a number of years, um, the, the, like, the, the companies that I've heard who have implemented this, you know, that it tends to be, it's like, hey, we get better at firefighting when all of a sudden, you know, the manager's bonus depends on us, like, being able to solve this problem. So, you know, like, you, you don't necessarily want to be super prescriptive about it. It's like, let the security team solve it. So to summarize that then, Liam, you'd say measurement. If there's one thing you could do to be, start getting proactive is 
start to measure everything. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you can't improve stuff that you're not measuring it or else, you, you know, otherwise you're just like spitting into the void. My one, also, I'm gonna, we're going to go to Ken as well, but my one little tidbit on that is be careful about how you measure and what you measure because if you show me how it's measured, I'll show you how it's made. And uh, that, that can lead to a whole other piffle of problems. But No, I was going to add to what Liam said. I mean, in terms of firefighting, like I've seen a fair amount of AppSec teams and, and strategies at this point in my career. And the one thing I really like about the way uh, our team has structured it is that we like specifically only care care about a small like bit of things. Like we own plenty of properties and <laughs> the subdomain takeover crap is <laughs> so annoying. We deal with it all the time. So and like we have similar approach to trying to fix that. But the thing is like um, mo there is varying risk of severity with that. You're right. But most of the time we're pretty much just focused on like a core set of apps and everything else is like not on our, not in our data center. It's not, it doesn't host things that are sen like things that are sensitive. Like we, you know, that's, that doesn't make us, let's, let's say that's not what keeps us up at night. So that's not what we can focus on so much. And that's not what we choose to focus on. So when you talk about firefighting, I think it's also very good to like say this is the scope of what we care about. And everything else is sort of extra, right? But like in terms of proactive approaches, um, so we've got uh, AppSec used to be AppSec, but we split into ProdSec and AppSec. So one of the, the recent things, like, so CSP, yeah, absolutely. I think you need CSP, like, straight away. You, you definitely do. That's but, content security policy. I'm sorry, I keep saying CSP. <laughs> well, we're at an AppSec conference, so I've, I, like, I figured, you know, yes, content security policy. Um, but, like, ProdSec has done some amazing things with, you know, building two-factor authentication into the application, uh, giving people audit, um, like, audit information or alerts like, you know, multiple sign-ins, you know, hey, today you're in Japan, or, you know, a minute ago you're in Japan, next year in, like, Dublin, this seems weird, that kind of stuff. Um, but, like, recently they did a, you know, uh, have I been pwned um, integration so that you use a breached password, you get an alert. Those types of, like, awesome, the, the whole overarching thing is I'm talking, talking about if you have a product, having a portion of the team is developed to hardening that product. That's a really great proactive approach. The other thing is you had mentioned bug bounties, Julian. And I actually really love, like before. Well, as a consultant, obviously there's conflict. There's a conflicting uh, sort of uh, mindset about uh, bug bounties. So now I have a different opinion now that I'm not doing consulting. Um, but bug, you know, bug bounties for us have been amazing, and I think a big part of that is cultivating the relationship with your hackers. Like we did a hacker one event in Las Vegas, but uh, being really, if I could leave you one thing, like be very uh, mindful and thoughtful in how you respond to your researchers. You can get a pretty bad name and they will not want to come to you. Pay well, pay very well. I mean, if you're at the point where you can do a bug bounty and you can have people uh, you know, do it, like you want to reward them, you want them to come back. And also cultivate your core group as well. So like if you're doing a bug bounty, have a core group that like they're repeatedly giving you awesome findings. And so you give them additional like access to new features and things like that to go test out and make sure you just take care of them. So those are, those are my things, my thoughts on that. So. Lucky last. <laughs> um, I was actually going to bang the city speed drum as well. So now I have to think of something else. Um, <laughs> I think one of the things that I've noticed work, that works really well where I'm currently working is our um, security guilds and all our other guilds as well. Um, we recently tackled the, the subdomain takeover as well. Seems to be a popular topic at the moment. Um, and just the interest of people just trying to figure out, you know, what happened, how can we do better, and just sharing, um, you know, sharing these caring, sharing the piece of code, um, putting it available so that everybody else can use it, seeing what other people are working on. If you want to talk about preventive and, and quick turnarounds, I mean, there's no better, no better solution than um, code reuse and just using what you already have and, and um, you know, improving that and, um, you know, evolving, evolving what you have or perhaps standardise a couple of things so that everyone has to use it. Um, that's, yeah, that's what we need to do. Try and change the <laughs> Yeah, so I thought of something. Um, proactive, as far as like getting rid of your firefighters. So we had um, a lot of issues come through the bug bounty program over the like kind of peaks and troughs as the year goes by and um, good hackers kind of come and go. Um, we had a really busy month in March this year. We had like this 
ridiculously good researcher, um, just absolutely trashed out all of our apps um, in a good way, but like um, it just got so overwhelming for our team at the time and we were just in firefighting mode like for a constant two weeks or so, two or three weeks. Um, and something that we changed there, we have this kind of internal uh, process for incident response for regular incidents, um, like performance or reliability incidents. So we kind of like piggybacked on that process um, to get that kind of learning happening as well throughout the whole organization. So everyone, so we have this kind of Slack channel where there's like um, production issues. So everyone gets alerted basically within the product development teams if something goes wrong, uh, serve one incident. So we kind of just piggybacked on that and said if we have a big enough incident through the bug bounty program, we'll chuck it in there, write off a really good uh, Jira ticket explaining the issue, um, even sometimes do like a quick slide deck to explain the issue and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that seemed to work really well from that kind of uh, in, like emergency kind of, oh, my God, we need to fix this kind of point of view. Um, and the wider adoption across multiple teams so multiple teams can learn from the same issues rather than just one isolated team getting the issue. Um, and over time, that kind of helped so that when issues came through, we weren't triaging them all ourselves. We could actually push that to the team. They had that kind of enthusiasm and urgency about it took it on and then like really felt empowered to go and fix it and, and all that and take it through the whole process. Um, so that kind of, that was really positive, yeah. So uh, one of the questions that just came to mind and granted this might be more of a hypothetical if, if you don't actually have uh, this in place, but um, one of the questions that I always like to ask folks is what's in your lab? So if you don't have one, maybe you haven't had one in a while because, you know, work-life balance and all that other stuff and you've now transitioned into different roles, what would you put in your lab if you didn't have time to, to put one together today? So we'll start with Lydia. Uh, my lab currently, because I'm doing lots of malware analysis, um, I've, got, uh, I've got multiple different virtualization um, platforms, so, um, so different types of hypervisors. I just don't play with one. Um, mainly because I want to see the effects of malware as opposed to different types of um, virtualization platforms. So you'll find that, for example, a piece of malware that goes through uh, an EC2 instance versus um, VirtualBox versus um, a KVM, the result is, is very different. So I enjoy doing that. I've got lots of different things like that. Um, if I had more time, which I'm trying to get more time, because I have seven-year-old twins, um, I'm trying to set up my network at home to be more segmented. Um, I basically want to put all the IoT devices on a separate network. Um, I want to put six Why would you want to do that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, I think all the cartoons are slowing the network down. <laughs> Too much streaming. Um, but that's, yeah. that's the ransomware, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Someone's got a ransomware the Samsung TV. Um, so that, that's my thing at the moment. Um, I've still got my research going on with lots of malware. Um, I want to see what the effects are and, and different, different side channel um, attacks and all this other stuff, but I don't have time to properly set up the Wi-Fi like I want at home. That's what I'd like to do next. Okay. Uh, yeah, for me, I would say it's not hypothetical at all because, I mean giving a training class with Seth up there here uh, and at AppSec USA. And so our lab setup was basically we uh, found some interesting open source applications. I do a lot of code review and uh, just downloaded them and um, went through the process. And I like to find poems in those types of apps, especially because like I have to learn new languages all the time these days um, and want to. And so that's always fun. Uh, another thing is like, what were some of those apps, by the way? So you, you mentioned you downloaded a bunch of open source apps. What were maybe some of them that you played with? So the ones that I would, for this, specifically for this class, um, I don't think you've probably heard of some of them, but like uh, Keystone, so Node.js app uh, was a big one I was kind of messing around with. Um, I should almost bring you down to, to talk about some of these. That, you know, you're done. You're fried. <laughs> yeah. You're, Jet lag. you're alone now. You're I'm all alone. I'm all alone. Yeah, no. So, I mean, Keystone was mainly the one I, I worked uh, with. Uh, I did start looking at Node Go a little bit, but um, the, let's say we had a bunch of them. There was like, so we had basically a Django, Rails, Java. I don't look at like .NET and Java for fun. I just don't do that. I'm not a sadist. Uh, but like, yeah, sorry. Not sorry. Um, so we had like Django CMS. That was fun to look at. That was an open source app. Um, yeah, there's a, so, and if you ever want to do this, like, yes, there are all the vulnerable, purposefully vulnerable applications, but also, like, just genuinely vulnerable applications out there. So you go to the awesome list of 
curated apps, and you can download them from there. But the other thing I was going to say is like AppSec and Poly don't want to spin this off, but AppSec and uh, like DevOps kind of with the with AWS and Google Cloud and all that stuff, like that's all that's all sort of merging what we do. Um, I found at least so you should definitely get yourself an account on there and play with that. That's what I do. So. Well, I mean, I'm a fantastic consultant, so your prod network is sort of my lab. <laughs> you mean my QA environment, I mean, right? right? When, when, I, when I say you, I mean, you know, my clients. I don't, you know, it's all, it's all authorized. Um, but, like, because we, we look at, you know, so many varying different environments, um, we, we, you know, we quite often need to replicate it, um, and it's like it's so diverse that you know you just can't have a static lab. But um, it's super cool that everyone's moved to like you know a couple of like three different cloud platforms that anyone can use. Because you know if I need to replicate what you're doing in AWS, like I just spin it up in AWS in 20 minutes, and all of a sudden I have a lab that's you know extremely similar to your prod environment. If I do need to test stuff, so um, yeah, th thanks cloud. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think mine probably changes a little bit over time depending on what I'm doing or what project I'm working on. So I think if you're a developer trying to get more, or like a technology professional trying to get more involved in security, it's probably a different kind of lab because my, my labs are like more learning about what the latest uh, development tools are. Like if we're, you know, we're playing around with Go a little bit, so I want to learn that language and get kind of used to that. So I'm setting up like Go or like Docker or like just kind of building random shit. Um, trying to keep up with that so that I can kind of advise from a security perspective on some of these different frameworks and tools. Um, so I think that's, yeah, I mean, definitely changes and it's all just typical open source stuff. Sometimes I'll do like a little side project, like build a website in AWS or put something in front of CloudFront, like just random shit that doesn't really uh, mean much and then that helps me learn. So basically, yeah, similar things. But it definitely changes throughout the year depending on what I'm working on and, and, and that kind of thing. What's in your I was just going to actually answer that. So for, for me, one of the things I always recommend to, to just about everybody is um, if you're not familiar with Docker today, go get familiar with it because containers are going to literally eat your entire stack at some point. And so uh, if you're a security professional and you're not really familiar with Docker, go put a vulnerable web application in a Docker container and get it running and then start attacking it. And if you're a developer that is familiar with Docker, go Dockerize a vulnerable web application and then go start attacking it. Yeah, and most of the vulnerable applications do come with Docker files to make it easy to get them running on Docker, so it's, yeah. I, I would suggest in this case, though, like, don't use that. Actually, go write your own Docker file and really oh, yeah. figure it That's out because point. you're going to need to know it as a security professional at some point. Don't do it with Kubernetes because then you're just a sadist. I, I mean, <laughs> eventually you're going to need to know that, but... Um, Kubernetes is hard. So, um, so yeah, my lab is, is basically just all Docker containers of lots of different um, vulnerable web applications of, you know, different varieties, different stacks. Um, also, I, I mean, as an aside, one of the things I do similar to Julian is, is I actually uh, gave a talk last year at HackFest. You can go look it up. Uh, it was HackFest Canada 2017 on attack-driven development. So the other thing that I do is I actually write vulnerable applications on purpose in new languages and frameworks and libraries because I want to know how a language or framework or library is vulnerable. Then I go and I learn how to do that attack against that framework. And then I iterate. I make it just a little bit more secure. So maybe it, I limit, you know, the number of things I allow it to take in. Maybe I have a little bit more like, you know, regular expression checking, things of that nature. Um, and then you just keep going, right? So then you know what's really bad, what's somewhat okay, how to bypass that somewhat okay thing, what's maybe a little bit better, and then eventually you also know what's really good. Um, so as both developers and security professionals, you have an opportunity to learn all the attacks, all the new languages and frameworks, and of course, what bad is, what good is, and all the things in between. So that's kind of what's in my lab. Yeah, like to add to that, I think you're right on the money there, because like the approach uh, generally is, you know, it's the SSRF and this or that. Where the framework nuances, that's the piece where you're constantly refining your skill set. Like that stuff changes, the frameworks changes, what's popular changes. Like, and yeah, you're sharpening that sort of skill set with, with doing that. Cool. I, we're almost out of time, so we probably have time for maybe one more audience question. Uh, you know, hands up, anybody, this is the last question of the day. Oh, oh, there we go. Perfect. Hey, didn't have to go far. <laughs> um, maybe a slightly bigger picture question, and I'm a developer but not a security professional. Um, you might have a better um, perspective because you've seen under the um, 
kimono, for want of a better word, in, in, in various places. So in one, in one sense, uh, to quote the Lego movie, everything is awesome. <laughs> amazing supercomputer in my pocket with an amazing camera. I can catch an Uber and I can see where it is. You know, medical uh, devices, etc. But really, as an industry, we, we don't know what we're doing. I'm sure pen testers can go lots of places and, and pop the hood really, really easily. Mac OS has a release where anyone can log in. You know, is everything awesome or is everything terrible? Should I go be an Amish person with no technology <laughs> in a Faraday cage? <laughs> As things going to get better or are they always going to be terrible? I love this question. I like the... <laughs> I mean, you, you couldn't have picked a better, better you know song, you know, from the Lego movie because, you know, like at the start it's, you know, everything is awesome and then, you know, as spoilers for anyone who hasn't seen the Lego movie, but <laughs> everything is not awesome. Um, but, you know, um, yeah, I mean, we've had all these issues with security. It's like, yeah, you know, like you say, OS X, you know, put out a release where, you know, you just hit mash enter a bunch of times at a command prompt and then you, you get in, which... Um, like, we, we had this old laptop that had been in the, the cupboard for, like, months, and then we needed to get into it, and we forgot the password, and we are just like, wait, is this running that release? It is. It has been in the cupboard. It hasn't been patched since then. We're in. That was great. Um, but, so, yeah, I mean, all, all these things have happened, but the world hasn't fallen apart. You know, like, people say, oh, you know, we're, we rely on, you know, IT infrastructure for, you know, it's such an integral part of our society these days. And it's like, yeah, and these, these vulnerabilities um, happen, as they will, you know, like, it, it, it will, and will continue to. Um, but the world hasn't fallen apart because um, security is a lot more than just vulnerabilities you know like security is risk management you know when when people like find out I'm a pen test you know people with no technology background they they always say who's got the best security i bet it's the banks right and like banks got pretty good security but it's not the best in the industry but do banks lose money nope because they they do risk management they they say what's the worst that could happen and for, for a lot of the time, um, the, the worst that could happen is like, oh, you know, we might lose $10 million here. You know, if, if there's... Because people are always... Like, individuals are worried about their bank account getting cleaned out. It's like, if your bank account got cleaned out by, like, an O-Day um, against the bank, like, the bank would just refill your account because what they're really concerned about is their reputation. And that's, you know, that's them managing their risks at a much higher level. Um, and big organisations are generally good at risk management. So, like, we, we sort of focus on these, like, tiny little details of technology. You know, we've, we've seen under the hood, and we're like, no, oh, everything's broken. It's like a lot of things are broken all the time, but all the things that aren't broken sort of compensate for them. So um, I, it's, it's easy to be a nihilist, um, but that's sort of, you know, like losing sight of the forest for the trees. I need to know everybody else. Is everything awesome or like... <laughs> no, but I don't think people care. Honestly, philosophically, I mean, look at like how little people really value their privacy anymore. And I'm complicit in it as well. I mean, we all put Alexa... Well, maybe not all, but a lot of people put like Alexa and Google Cloud in your home and you have cameras. And, you know, at what point like people get breached and guess what? Their stock ends up going up. So like, so are you the honest the Facebook uh, camera thing that you know they're putting in there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, at what point do people actually care anymore besides us in this room and rooms like this? So I guess as I get older, I'm kind of like, I don't know. Like, it's great because we have job security and businesses care about this. <laughs> <laughs> My kid will definitely be able to go to college. <laughs> but like, as a society. Do we care? I guess that's my real question. Lydia, go, go for it. Yeah, I'm kind of on the Liam camp here. Um, having worked at a bank for a very long time, the risk management thing was always stuck in my head. And also very similar to the talk that I did this afternoon, I was talking about bolting on versus building in. It does always it does come down to the risk that you try and protect and, um, and, and the value that you place on that. Um, and things get honed and breached and publicised on the internet all the time and stocks still go up and people live and the world is still happy. You know, if you ask me, every time I go into an incident, the first thing I say is, is anyone dead? 
No? Okay, <laughs> then we're good. Right? Actually, I'll ask you, actually ask that question during the week for something or other. Um, I think it is getting better because we're all getting smarter and I think that we're all collaborating a lot better. And I try not to see everything as black and white. I try to see what's grey and, and what we can do. And uh, so I don't think everything's awesome, but I don't think it's a, it's a disaster either. Yeah, it's interesting, that, that kind of point around, do people actually care? Um, that, like, that's really interesting, because when you start to look at risk-based approaches, you're like, would someone care if their bank account was drained, not if they just got it topped up again? Like, and, and I think um, uh, someone was saying the other day around, um, you know, if, if you're, like, so dedicated, like, would you really leave Facebook? Like, most people did during that kind of incident that happened. Well, not most people, but a handful of people did, but realistically they still have like 95, 99% of their user base still around and messaging random cat pictures and stuff to people. <laughs> like, you know, like that'll, and then it'll kind of blow away next year and their stock price might go back up again. Like, is, is the stock price the thing that companies care about the most? Potentially, maybe long-term kind of brand reputation damage and loss of customers. <laughs> Um, so they're very kind of focused on their business, whereas as a society, do we care enough about our privacy of that information that's getting breached throughout, and this kind of con like collection of data, right? So it's now data from everywhere. We've got different types of data at different points in time. Um, what does that actually mean? Like, this is more of a question rather than answering anything. Yeah. But like, have we as a society figured out what that's going to mean for us in, say, 10, 20 years' time, having all this data publicly available. Right now, it doesn't seem like having your social security number or, like, or your PII data publicly available or some password hashes here and there, like, the, you know, unless they get into your account using that password kind of thing. But, like, have we actually figured that out? And maybe I'll pose the question to you guys if you have any insights, but I'm actually really curious. I will add this. I don't know if anybody here watches John Oliver, but does it, there was this like special he did. This was after Edward Snowden where he leaked that basically our government's spying on us, right? Uh, a bunch of documents. And uh, so they asked people in Times Square, you know, like, does this concern you? Does that concern you? The government's doing this. And like, they're like, no, no, no. But you know what consistently everyone cared about? Nudie pics of themselves. That's what they cared about. Nothing else. <laughs> I guess that's what the risk the, the risk profile is. That's but, the line. So. Yeah, that's the line. But you, you bring up the 18 to 20 years from now, and like not to put the tinfoil hat on, but like I just saw that Alexa is going to have some sort of mood behavior analysis performed on its users. <laughs> How close to Fahrenheit 451 do we have to get before we're like we're trading convenience every day or trading uh, privacy every day for convenience? And there's I uh, saw so there's a really awesome keynote last week at AppSec USA, and then. They were talking about like how uh, like AI is getting so good, and um, that you can actually detect from a, a video of someone, you can detect their heart rate, like with a very high degree of accuracy. So this is like really early stages, um, and so it's like medical data now. Potentially, if you have like Facebook gets breached and some videos of you or you're presenting, like. Some of the data, we don't, we don't even know what kind of consequences it might be of being public later on. So it's kind of as technology gets bigger and bigger. So it's going to be interesting times to see, like, at some point we might hit a tipping point. Maybe it's nude pics, maybe it's not. Like, we don't know where, where that line's going to be, where consumers actually start caring about this kind of stuff. It would be interesting. Yeah. I was just going to say, nobody cares because nobody's dead. And uh, the example that I pose is that I talked about the Grenfell fire that happened last year where 74 people died. And when you look at the construction of a building, there's so much engineering work that goes into that to make sure that the people that live in a building are safe. And we don't put that level of effort into building software. We just don't, because lives don't matter. And I guess that's the impact that if something gets breached, stocks, stocks just go up because... It's it's something intangible that it's looked okay like, don't worry I can't say it I guess it really didn't matter the banks are refilling your account um, the you can't actually see your data because Troy Hunt's not necessarily <laughs> publicising it but you know it's there so it really didn't happen. So um, with that just I want to be cognizant of time uh, I'll just wrap this up on. You don't need to unru uh, outrun the bear. You just need to outrun the person next to you. So whether or not things are good, that's uh, final thoughts. Thank you for the panel, by the way. Thank you for coming to you. Good job.